What's a monthly battle? I mean, you know, everyone wants to. I mean, like, it's, it's, for me, a lot of this is that this is done. You know, there are other places to have these these larger conversations. This is a this is a battlefield relic. But it's a really the biggest thing about it is the pocket park for Grant Park. For the people that live on Boulevard in Atlanta, this is their little pocket park because they're, di they're disconnected by the zoo. So, so they probably want to turn this into a frisbee zone or a dog yeah, park. Not really. I, what they really, what they really, I would contest probably what they really want to do is um, activate it more with different things, stuff like that. It's kind of for me. I think the draw and attraction is that it's it, it's not. Like, which is you know, what which most of the park was like this at one this time. This is what, well the other thing too is the whole point of this was you started um, down there, uh, Mill, you basically in, you came in either on Augusta, which was Claiborne originally, and then you come into Millage Park here, and you would work your way up here and find yourself in Fort Walker, and you can't really do it right now because the trees are on wood. But the point was sand in old Atlanta, which was the park. And then look, I mean, which was the fort, and then look downtown and see New Atlanta. So you were seeing the future. So you stood in the past to look forward to the future. I mean, it was, that was the design. But, you know, everybody, everybody has different opinions. And then this, um, so that was this, but then this is Wilbur Kurtz over here who wrote this part. So where you are right now, you are in Fort Walker. So this is, if you will, the top end of Grant Park. And one of the biggest things we're saying about preservation, the reason it's still here is because Boulevard is right over there and it lands right there. So this fell, if you will, within the confines of the park. So literally, if you think about this entrenchment, so forth, that would have stretched this way, that way, and so forth. So this kind of fortification wouldn't have been throughout the city, but obviously doesn't exist anymore there because residential components were built, but this survived. As a side note to this whole thing, you're also looking at arguably one of the great resources for this side of Grant Park because it really becomes a pocket park, kind of a silent space because it's cut off by the zoo. So the zoo kind of makes this little piece cut off. So if you look at it, due to a, a less active space, it's really enjoyed. Like you just saw the guys ride their bikes and so forth. This has really been a great place for people to learn to ride their bikes. They bought the dogs, they meet up here. And, and a lot of, it's a, it's a really great spot. But this all being said, after, when Grant Park was donated in 1983, the component and the idea was to build amenities and various things in here. And you would start either down there where the cyclorama kind of is, because remember, the park opens up, and it's really within 24, 36 months, the cyclorama and the zoo come in. It was a very short-lived period. So that became kind of an entry point. And what you would do is you would come through the park and end up in Fort Walker. The culmination being is that you would stand here in old Atlanta, and before all the trees were grown up, before everything, you'd see the capital and see, if you will, the new south, new Atlanta. So the point was to look forward. And that was this kind of methodology in it. Now, then um, Governor John B. Gordon was obviously activated and so forth to find things, because they really wanted to make an active really, uh, relic, if you will, something that really looked like what Fort Walker would have looked like. But here lies the great story. So I'm from Rome, Georgia originally. The street you just walked up is called Rome Street. And the reason it's called Rome Street is in the 1880s, there was a big drought up in Northwest Georgia. And so remember, Rome was the first place to be burned by Sherman. So when they had, after the Rome 
capitulated and they had all this captured Confederate artillery, you know, what are they going to do with it? They just threw it in the river. Well, with the drought, all that stuff became exposed. So, you know, that's the guy. So they found this. And so Gordon said, fine, take this stuff, decorate it, super duper, bless it. Mm, it's all wonderful. Well, they get the whole thing set up. It's all set up. Everything's great. They come up here to have the dignitaries to open the whole thing up. Everybody starts gasping. The GMI guns, the Georgia Military Institute guns, the two that have been missing, everybody wondered what happened to them. They were right there. That's the war. So now, if you go to the Capitol and you go to the side where the Gordon Equestrian statue is, and you go to that entrance on Washington Street, those two guns, those are the GMI guns that were in the Etowah River base, that were right there, they're now there. Then, when the Psychorama hey, moved. Let me stop you. So, for about 50 years, there were a bunch of cannons out there, right? Yes, there were caissons, cannons, all kinds of stuff. At one point in time, there was a water tower here, playground here. This went through all kinds of transitions. Also, the Arkansas gun, so the Arkansas Military Institute gun was up here as well, which is now the History Center. And that was a big coup de grace thing. To to and there's actually paperwork goes, and the, the, the uh, commanding officer of that division that gave up that gun here at the Battle of Atlanta lamented leaving that gun behind more than did the soldiers that died. So that he'd been, that gun had done more for him than a soldier. I mean, he really wrote this kind of almost like, you know, my God, my God, we had to leave the gun. Do you know what I mean? So you, you get in this. So what happened when I moved to Grant Park and this kind of stuff, Fort Walker was not uh, desolate. There was a lot of weird 70s funk carryover, meaning you had like a little house, the prairie fence out front. The, the, bullion, the, the, the entrance to it was kind of poo pooey. Um, it was on a marker post it was all bent up whatever it is so systematically I worked with the state store preservation office got a new marker post for it um, we worked for the city fixed up a lot of stuff for the entrance to go in here um, I was I always loved telling that everyone told me I'd never get the road repaved it's repaved so you know these kind of things but then this this piece of granite was over there and it was basically kind of thing like everything that could be stolen was stolen but nobody could steal that it was too big and too heavy so it, it made it by no other thing that was too big so we worked with the African Old chapter of the United Arms Confederacy and so forth and put a bunch of money to restore this, to put it back in, because it is a remnant and um, this is a battlefield monument. This is not venerating or validating, or, you know, no political methodology in a certain level. This is really geared towards something about the Battle of Atlanta. And the thing that really gets kind of fascinating to think about is this is really 1864 Atlanta. This is kind of your big booyah piece that you have here because you have this entrenchment, you have this kind of thing, and you still kind of have the lay of the land. This was a cemetery before it was an entrenchment. It went on. Now, and you know, there's great, there's, you know, there's great layers of how it's done. George, and I, as a quick side note, George Washington Lee, if you've never heard of him before, George Washington Lee was kind of the, the sheriff, if you will, of Atlanta. And so he would be the one that would use both enslaved labor and conscript labor, would have built fortifications like this. He would have been a big computer. But a real quick side note of George Washington Lee, going back to Rome, George again, when Atlanta fell, as they were going to Milledgeville, it was George Washington Lee, because the, you know, Governor Brown, everybody's losing their mind, like, oh God, they're coming, they're coming. It was Lee that went there. You see, the, you know, remember the great scene of the Godfather, like, be a man, be a man. Lee's the one that went nuts and said, stop it. And he got all of our archives and records, put them on a train and sent them to Augusta. And that's why all of our history is at the Georgia archives and not in Washington, D.C. George Washington Lee went on to die in Rome, Georgia, buried an unmarked grave, and so we put a headstone in where he, all these guys are, and they're there. So Bob Davis was putting out a new book. So it's a big plug to Bob right now on the whole thing of this guy. He's a real, he's a real weird. Arguably the first guy to enlist the Confederacy went to Pensacola. Thought that because everybody thought he was going to be Charleston, Pensacola. He's in Pensacola. Didn't happen. Soon starts having Charleston. Beeline's over there. The whole thing. So it's a real cool thing. This really encompasses a lot of that diaspora to discuss so much of Atlanta because you think about it. You don't have a segregated park. You have a space everybody's accessing it. South Atlanta is right down there. South Atlanta is where uh, car, um, the, the, uh, the AU starts down there, and you have, oh my God, Clark Atlanta starts down there. So Clark University is first there in South Atlanta. All your black clergy down here. Over here is Georgia Avenue, East Orthodox Jew, Irish Catholic. Capitol Avenue, old, old Jewish, old white kind of crowd, different thing. All this kind of stuff. So this park encompasses a lot of that. It's, it's always going to be complex. People are always got opinions. They're always got stuff. But the great thing about it is the challenge of conversations. Edward R. Murrow said is what brings out the best of people. And so having this here, having this space here is fabulous. The, the last thing I'll say to you about it, and I'll have to be conscript time, 
big thing. You will see, if you come here randomly, throughout the depth of the summer, this is used by everybody. It's a real kind of tongue-in-cheek way of saying, you can complain all you want, but all these people seem to be real happy. And it'd be a fascinating thing, how many families and people you see in here. And this spot right here, because this tree line grove exists right here, and we used to have a big sassafras here, and you see another one's growing out now. But all this kind of stuff, this is lined up people, little grills cooking out. Of course, they're supposed to not do that, but they do it anyway. Little small things, but you just see people, unfortunately, they're all happy. And the big thing about it is, yeah. is because it's small, it's not loud, and it's quiet. And it's a great place of remembrance, and it allows people, for me, arguably a great place to be things. You don't really see it over here with the zoo. We have all kinds of hawks and owls. And this also gives you a vista of uh, when you think about the Olmstead plan that existed for Grant Park, the kids were the, the two, the sons were the one that did it. But this really illuminates so much of what the Olmstead idea was better than it was in Grant Park that remains. David! All right. Yeah.